heart for you My heart, my mind, my soul My life, my body, my heart It's all for And all for My hopes, my dreams, my Welcome to another installment of uh, the Voice of the Bride webinar. Um, hope you've enjoyed the worship of Dave Lewandowski. Uh, we have a, a talented staff here and I appreciate all the hard work they do to, to make this possible. Uh, Caleb and Josiah uh, pretty much have come up with the idea of doing the webinars. Josiah does most of the, the setting up and uh, the orchestrating of it. Uh, 
Um, if you'd like to write Josiah and let him know how much you appreciate it, do so, Josiah at whitedoveministries.org. Uh, if you have any suggestions or uh, input or just thoughts or whatever, you, you know, we, love, we like getting responses from people. hope you will be free to do that. Um, next, uh, next Tuesday, you got Bobby Connor coming. <clears throat> I hope if you're not here locally, you watch by streaming, but if you're here locally, uh, come and be with us. Um, I think it's going to be an outstanding time. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to write Bobby an email tomorrow and just give an outline of what we're going to do and um, I, I'm expecting him to do great things. I'm expecting him to prophesy about the region. Every time I've seen him over the last, last um, several months, he's told me he has a word for us. I don't think it's just for White Dove Ministries. I feel like it's for the for the region. Bobby goes way back with us, back to 1991, and uh, I was watching a video that we're going to show next week of. R.W. Schambach sharing a testimony of the 26 creative miracles in the, the little fellow that came from Knoxville, Tennessee. And when I was watching it, I realized that I was in the building when it was prophesied, when he was sharing that back in 1991. And Bobby Connor was too. Uh, he was there. I didn't know him then. I met him later in the year. But uh, we're just excited about it. I hope you'll enjoy it. And uh, those of you that are local that happen to be streaming tonight, we want to see you there. I want to really show a good support for, for Bobby. And, uh, and again, thank you for those of you that, that give. There's you know many of you that have helped us during this time, and we appreciate that uh, very much. So without any further ado, let's dig into the Word of God. I want to just pray and ask the Lord to help us. I believe the spirit of, of revelation is, is very attainable today. I believe there's a download of understanding the Lord has given us right now. I, secrets and things that prophets long to see are being revealed today. And just like today, I spent my, the, the bulk of today not just uh, in prayer, but just reading and researching and, you know, getting the, the full biblical foundation of the things that I'm teaching. And it's just amazing how much is being revealed. It's almost like you, if you just spend any time at all right now, uh, in the, the floodgate begins to be open and revelation begins to flow and things begin to connect, you know, and things you, you may have heard years ago or things you haven't fully been able to embrace. There's just a grace on it right now. I'm even seeing things, you know, in, in this subject that I've spent a good bit of time studying throughout the years. I'm seeing insights that I, that I haven't seen before, and I hope to share some of those tonight. So, so, Lord, we just ask that you bless us tonight, that you would open our eyes of understanding and illumine the eyes of our heart. We ask, Lord, that you trust us with your secrets, that among this remnant of people, you'll find a body of people that are trustworthy stewards of the mysteries and of the power of God. Grant that, I pray, that your kingdom can be manifested in the earth, that people can begin to walk in the maturity that has been prophesied in Scripture, that a body of people will not shun to declare the whole counsel of God. Lord, raise up these apostles like you promised to do in this last day generation that will begin to reestablish what it means to be an apostolic generation. They'll redefine our language and revalue our currency back to the biblical basis and the biblical foundation. Grant that, I pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going to start. I'm going to start uh, the webinar tonight with a little bit of an unusual thing. This morning, you know, most days at night, you know, I'll either read or listen to the Bible, and sometimes in the morning. And I've been getting up kind of early. And this morning, uh, Wanda knew that I was had been reading and praying, and so she said, "Go ahead and turn on the scriptures if you want to listen to them." So I, I thought, okay, and I got my little iPad, you know. And, uh, and for whatever reason, I just felt inclined to go to Revelation 18. <laughs> I know that's probably not the best scripture in the world to wake up to in the morning, but I, I started playing Revelation 17 and 18, actually, all the way to the end of, uh, of 22. 17, 18, 19, 20, and all through 22, the return of the Lord, and the Lord manifests himself as the Word of God. But I heard something this morning. I think it wasn't an accident that I did that. Uh, as I was, you know hearing about the, the judgment of Mystery Babylon. Wow. Listen, that's a great thing. And uh, you know what? I, I think we're not too far from that. I believe this in the very foreseeable future that God's about to judge a system of religion that, that promotes confusion. But I heard something in it today that I thought had direct relevance to the subject that we're talking about in the Voice of the Bride webinar, and that is the cloud of witnesses. There's a message we brought in relationship to the cloud of witnesses called the cloud of witnesses and the justice of God. And it ties back to Daniel chapter 7 where it says that the ancient of days was manifested and uh, the books were opened before him. 
And you have to wonder what it, what's in those books. And I believe the Lord has given us the secret that it's every unjust act ever committed against the people of God. Uh, if he's a judge, what what's brought a, to him are violations or injustices. And the books are open, a record of all the injustices that have ever been committed throughout church history, throughout the time of from the covenant people of God, all the way back to the blood of Abel, right up to the present hour, when all the saints and all the martyrs that have been butchered and slain and tortured and uh, abused and ridiculed and all this going on throughout the years. Even in our generation, where we've had maybe not as much martyrdom in the West, but we've had certainly maligning and, uh, and all the other things that go with that. But the books are going to be open. And the Bible says that the horn of the adversary has been waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Now, I don't like that any more than you do. I don't like to, but that's in the scripture. And we, we can look at history. And we can see that the horn of our enemy, the power of our enemy, has certainly been rampant. Uh, look at the world wars in the 20th century. A hundred and something million people were killed in war. That's the enemy. And, and the famine and the pestilence and, and all that goes with it. God's not the author of those things. Our enemy has killed 57 million of our brothers and sisters in Christ and all the gifts and callings and all the manifestations of the Spirit and all that they would have done on the earth was stolen from them and that act of injustice was recorded in the books. And those books are going to be opened and God's going to see all of those injustices. And there'll be one generation, and we're it. We're that generation that will see the Lord fulfill His promise and render a verdict on favor of the saints and the saints will take possession of the kingdom. The horn of the adversary has waged war with the saints and overpowered them until... The Ancient of Days renders a verdict in favor of the saints, and the saints take possession of the kingdom. Wow. I want to be there for that. I want to see that. And I believe that we're in that season of time when you and I, as the last day army of God, the last day champions, the, the bride of Christ slash sons of the kingdom, are going to be given authority over some of these things. But it says in, in Revelation 17, talking about this mystery Babylon, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth... And he said, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. Then it says over in Revelation 18, verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, that you may not receive of her plagues, for her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquity. Well, you need to understand when, when God's a judge, uh, two things happen. He renders a verdict in favor of one and against another. And when he renders a, a verdict in favor of the saints, it means that everything that's ever been stolen will be, will be remedied. Well, those people are now in the cloud of witnesses. Those people are now in a, they're not walking the earth in human form. So if God's going to remedy what was stolen from them, he's got to find an agency on the earth that he can bless and put in them what would have been done by that great company of people in the past. And, uh, you know, that's pretty tremendous. The Apostle Paul was murdered, and uh, that was an unjust act. He didn't die a natural death. And so, therefore, because his life was cut short, uh, we have the right to believe that many, like the Apostle Paul, will be in the earth in the last day generation. When I first had this revelation, I asked the Lord to give me a, a scriptural, you know, foundation for it, something that would give a, a credence to it in Scripture. And when I asked that question, the Lord reminded me of Israel. When they went into to Egyptian bondage, Egyptian captivity, you know, at first it didn't seem so bad, you know, because the Pharaohs remembered Joseph, but then there were Pharaohs that forgot Joseph. They didn't know about the, the, the valor of Joseph, and they began to be harsh. And can you imagine 400 years of slavery? That just, you know, we read it on a piece of paper, we don't realize that's longer then the United States has been in existence. So that means from the days of prior to George Washington to the present hour, they were living in harsh, oppressive bondage. And no doubt they remembered the promise that had been given to Abraham that while they were sojourning down in the land of Egypt, that God would remember his promise and would bring them out with a mighty hand. And that they would, they would plunder the very nation they have served and all of that. And so uh, clearly they were, pre, you know, praying and believing for a deliverer to come on the scene year after year, generation after generation, some 10 generations or more, lived and died believing to be delivered, believing 
to go back into the land that belonged to them, and yet they saw none of it, but yet their prayers were captured. Their prayers went into a, a reserve account, if you will. The prayers are heard before the Lord. They're you know, placed in, in a censer before the, the, the Lord. And, uh, and finally, when the right generation was on the earth, when the time had come, the fullness of time juncture had come, then the Lord finds a deliverer. He finds someone to stand in the gap between Egypt and, and, uh, and the people of God. And I think that's where we are today. I really believe part of why this message has more credence right now is we're about to be the agency by which the Lord begins to remedy what's been lost, but also execute judgments on the things that have kept the people of God in bondage. And we're going to have to eventually say, come out of her, my people. We come out of this system that has caused so such torment and disgrace and blasphemies. That's what the Bible says. I'm just quoting the scriptures. You know, they've had horrendous things in history. We, we forget sometimes how this organized system butchered the people of God. The tyranny and the oppression of the leadership and the very reason this nation was founded was to get away from that kind of a, um, an environment where, where the, there was political and ecclesiastical powers functioning hand in hand, oppressing the people. And so here we are, about to be the ones to stand in the gap, as Moses did. And what happened with Israel was when, when deliverance came, one generation became the beneficiary of 400 years of prayer. One generation plundered Egypt. Israel had empowered Egypt. They had basically made them the most powerful nation on the planet with their ingenuity, their creativity, all that they have because they were blessed. And they empowered Egypt. They were the most powerful nation on the planet. And yet, one man goes and takes over with a stick, you know, and just a man with, that had a visitation, a man that had encountered God like I believe we're supposed to today. We're looking for some Moses to come on the scene today that have seen a burning bush or Maybe some Joshua's that met the captain of the host face to face and are pretty impressed with him, or you know, uh, people like Paul that were caught up to the third heaven, or had his Damascus Road encounter, or John, and all the different ones throughout history that we know of that had divine encounters. I am convinced that we need a divine encounter individually to step over into what we're called to do. I believe that. I'm believing it for myself. I'm believing it for you and for our staff and all the people here that are hearing the message tonight. We need an encounter with God. And when you see it, when, you, when that happens, your faith would go to another place. You then become a champion. Every one of those in Hebrews 11, this great cloud of witnesses that surround us had an encounter. They had a revelation on some level or another. Something catapulted them from the natural into the supernatural, from the seen un, into the unseen. And so my point of, of all that was that one generation plundered Egypt with all the wealth that they had created for the nation of Egypt. And that's a sign, if you will, that we will plunder the enemy's camp. And, and what will be restored into our generation will be all those gifts and all the years that people have prayed to see the promise of God manifested on the earth. And it'll be, it'll be granted. It'll be poured into one generation. And I don't think it'll, it'll be a long work. I believe it'll be a, a kind of a short work. So praise the Lord. I just want to start with that and, and uh, hope that, you know, motivates you a little bit. It does me. <laughs> Um, but we're going to go back to Hebrews chapter 12 now. You know, Hebrews 11 tells us the great, um, the great champions of faith, those that paid the price, those that had an encounter, those that changed our generation, ordinary folks. That's what I like about it. Shepherds and, you know, uh, farmers and, you know, ordinary people that had an extraordinary encounter. Simple as that. And that's all it, that's all it matters. Every person that's ever been used, so, you know, in, in a profound way, was just an ordinary person at the time that it happened. But Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that since we we have, since we presently have, currently, now have, so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame, having sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here's, here's an interesting thing, you know, in relationship to the cloud of witnesses. The Bible says that the Lord has sat down at the right hand of, of, of the throne of God. He sat down uh, and, wait, and he's waiting for his enemies to be made a footstool for his feet. 
Well, if his enemies are going to be subdued and he's seated waiting for that to take place, it must mean that somebody is going to do the subduing. Somebody is going to execute judgments and declare, let my people go. Somebody's going to stand before um, religious leaders, <laughs> political leaders, nations, and issue a proclamation, come out of her, my people, and partake not of her sin. I know that's a little bit strong language, but it's true. It's going to happen. Somebody's going to have to be the ones, not, not one somebody, many somebodies, a generation of champions that will stand in the gap and declare judgment. I believe literally the power of those things will be in our tongue. <clears throat> I believe we'll be able to, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, under the anointing, we'll be able to announce things and they'll happen. Uh, the judgments will come that way. The restoration will come that way. Uh, we'll stand between heaven and earth and begin to declare, restore, just like it says in Isaiah chapter 42. Restore what was lost by all of those that surround us. So I want to spend a good bit of time, in fact, probably the rest of the evening, in, uh, in Hebrews 12, beginning at verse 22. Uh, this is an, an incredible, incredible passage, you know, and if you look at verse 18, you know, you have to understand, by the way, if you want to go to the notes, you're welcome to do, they're on the screen. I'm going to start tonight with uh, F. <laughs> All the other ones, you know, you have from the prior meetings, but I'm going to start with F. And it tells us that Hebrews is a summation of the transition of the old covenant into the new, comparing the Mosaic era with the Christian dispensation. If the former age was punctuated with incredible encounters like the one that happened in Mount Sinai, how much more should we, since we're being given access spiritually to Mount Zion? What happened in the Old Testament with the great saints of God that we read about in Hebrews 11? All of those things happened in a covenant that was sealed with the blood of bulls and goats. Yet we have a better covenant with better promises sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ. So if Moses can see the Lord face to face as a friend speaks to a friend, then you can too. I'm not saying we can walk so up to God. And, you know, I, I don't think those things, as Kenneth Hagin said one time, they, they're not going to fall on you like ripe cherries from a tree. But if it's in your heart and you position yourself and let the Lord prepare you for that, then, then I believe exactly those things will happen. If, if there's something birthed in your heart that has not gone away with time, then it's God. There are things that were birthed in me in 1989 that haven't diminished one iota to this very hour. Uh, even if I haven't seen some of the things, I've seen more than I ever thought I would. But even if I haven't seen the things that were birthed in me, I still believe for it. And maybe tomorrow is going to be the day. Maybe there's something in me that needs to be worked. I don't know. But I'm simply telling you, if we're going to access the realm of the Spirit, if we're going to begin to stand in the gap between heaven and earth, if we're going to contend for the mantles, if you will, of those that have gone before us, if, if we're going to begin to preach the message that some of those great champions preach. I believe it invites them. I'm convinced that what you talk about comes. You talk about angels, they'll come. You talk about champions of the faith, they'll come. You talk about what they did and the mantle they carried and what you're going to, how you contend for it in this generation and what you're saying will come into the room. I believe right now as we talk about the cloud of witnesses, you know, that, that, we're, that we're being watched. <laughs> I believe that you're being watched because you're interested and you're participating in this, in this message. And so, you know, um, Hebrews 12, verses 18, just tells the story of Moses. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Comparing what they experienced at, at Sinai with what we experience today. I'm going to read the scripture, then I'm going to come back and talk about that for just a moment. It says, This sight was so terrible that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But he says, But you have come. We have not come to a mountain like the one that was on Sinai. We have not been given a command not to go up or not to touch it. We're not, we're not in that covenant anymore. But we are in the covenant that says you can come. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of of righteous men made perfect. The cloud of witnesses. I'm convinced that's just another way of, of saying the cloud of witnesses. We have come. That's a perfect tense verb. I looked that up. There's, you know, in a, perfect, a perfect tense verb means that it was in the past and is now. And, and there, there are truths in the Bible that were prophesied by Paul that was true then and still true now. 
And and if he's, if he if Paul said then we have come to Mount Zion then, and there were people that accessed that realm, I believe that John accessed what Paul describes right here. I believe the book of Revelation is is a picture of what John uh, of John encountering what was described right here, Mount Zion, the city of the living God. <laughs> the very throne of creation, myriads of angels, souls under the altar, great multitudes standing before the throne. I mean, he saw incredible things. If John can see those things, why can't we? Why are they relegated to one generation or to one person? I think that's a great error in Scripture, trying to make something only have application in a, in a generation. That's called cessationism. We do not subscribe to cessationism. I am of the utter conviction that what they experienced in the book of Acts, we can do today. Whatever we read about there, we can have today. You might say, well, what about the Old Testament? That, well, we can do that and more because we have a better covenant. If Gabriel can come to Daniel, he can come to you and I. If, uh, if Ezekiel can be caught up in the spirit and, and be taken from Babylon over into Jerusalem to see the city, so can you and I. And, and I believe those are real. You know, I, I wrote a newsletter and I've, I've gotten a little response and that um, it just went out the other day, but I already got some, not negative response, but, you know, cons um, a little negative. But, uh, you know, and I hope the person is watching because I have, a, I have an intention to write, you know, a response, but I had all day today to prepare for this. But, but in, in the newsletter, you know, I said that, um, that we need to, that the Apostolic Reformation will redefine our language and revalue our currency. We've watered down our currency. We call things that apostolic or prophetic or miraculous or whatever, they really are not. Um, and, and there's a body of people holding out for the biblical perspective on these things. And, and, and we've, we've used terms like vision and visitation and going to the throne room and all of that a little bit too carelessly, I'm afraid. And I, I knew that when I wrote that, I would get some feedback. I knew that. And I'm not trying to, deval I'm not trying to devalue your experience because we, we can have experiences on multiple levels. And I, I believe this is what the invitation is in Hebrews 12, that we have come to Mount Zion, that we can access the things that are discussed right here. And so, you know, my point was, let, if, if, if a person has a third heaven encounter, I would expect it to be what Paul had. If a person says they went to the throne room, I am 100% certain that John did not go to the throne room in Revelation 4 in his imagination he was there he was somehow taken out of his body or whether in the body or out Paul said he wasn't even sure but he was there fully functioning fully able to think and speak and and experience that it wasn't something that you just close your eyes and in your mind began to imagine listen is there value in that absolutely I believe in the imagination I do I, I believe it's a wonderful tool. I, I think we need to sanctify it a little more. <laughs> I think we need to get some stuff out of our system that probably can pollute or taint our imagination. Uh, but at the same time, I believe there is spiritual value there. I do. So I'm not taking that away. What I am trying to do is, say, is, is to take the language of third heaven encounters to another place. When somebody says, you know, I've been to the third heaven. I know some people. They're, they're men that I'm in fellowship with that, that if they tell me they went to the heaven... I have no question they've been there because I know their language. I know the definition of what they're trying to say. But too often we've had people that have, have said they went to heaven or they had this encounter and there's just no fruit. There's no fruit. Um, I know someone that has said that the Lord Jesus has appeared to them hundreds of times and yet there's not even the slightest degree of fruit in the person's character. I'm sorry. It's just true. I have a, I just believe that if I, if I encountered face to face the Lord Jesus Christ, I'd be a lot better person for it. <laughs> I just have to believe that I would not be the same person after one encounter, much less somebody saying they've had hundreds of face to face encounters with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, then you would think they would have this, you know, fantastic ministry and that the presence of God would be on them. They would be in the Lord's image. And, and I know this person and I, I can't say that those things are there. I'm, and I'm not being critical of the person. I'm just saying, wow, Lord, if, if that's a real experience, your Bible, the word says that when we see you face to face, we will be transformed. So I'm going to believe the word that if you have a face to face encounter, you will be transformed from glory to glory. 
and, and a reflection of his very image. So I just simply say all of that in connection with Hebrews chapter 12, that we have come to Mount Zion, and we have come to all of these things, but I want to focus on the one. We have come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to sprinkle blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. You know, if, you know, um, if, if you were to ask what is my, my goal for doing this session, these sessions on the cloud of witnesses, I, I guess it would be multiple goals. Um, I guess one of the primary goals that I would like to have established, one of the things that I would like to communicate well with, with, a, with a firm biblical foundation is that, that it is part of our heritage. It is part of our biblical environment. That if a person, that, that it is possible that God can send someone from the cloud of witnesses to bring a message from his heart or from his throne and it be legitimate. Too often we've heard people say, well, that's necromancy, and I hope I address that well. You know, anybody that uses an unholy, illegal spiritual discipline to try to contact any person who lived before is already in such gross violation of the scripture that, that they're already out there. <laughs> so necromancy is a discipline. It's an act. It's a, it's a very concentrated effort to try by someone with a, with a demon, <laughs> with an un unholy agenda to try to contact that other realm. And we used to always say, you know, well, they just, you know, they're calling up somebody, but they're getting a demon. They probably are, but, but you know, I'm not so sure that there's not some really horrendous things going on in the realm of the spirit. So, this has nothing to do with necromancy. The very definition of necromancy doesn't even have any application because necromancy is a discipline. This is just somebody who is in their pursuit of God. I, I believe the, tr the uh, healthy perspective on the cloud of witnesses is that as just we pursue God with all of our heart. As we focus on Him, as we contend to be closer to Him, to be in union with Him, if in the course of that destiny and in that journey, uh, God chooses to pull back the veil a little bit. Maybe maybe they're already here and he just wants to bless you and just separate the curtain for just a moment. And they're already there, so why not why not see them? If we have eyes to see, why, why wouldn't we see them? Uh, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of those things that are unseen. And so if God decides to pull back the veil and separate the curtain for just a moment, you'll see what's there. If they come and bring a message, maybe it's a message of, of instruction or, or whatever. Um, I guess this might be a good time to tell a story um, on Steve Shelley. I, I um, called him today, made sure it was okay to, 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 to share this today. But some of you that follow us probably remember years ago, I think we decided it was 2008, when I was doing a series on the, on the days of Noah. Uh, just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. And when the Lord asked me to do that, you know, I, I knew. I thought, oh, God, do I have to? <laughs> because I knew I had to address Genesis 6. You can't teach on the days of Noah without going back and addressing Genesis 6. And, and I felt like the Lord told me the only real model we have for this last day generation is Noah's generation. And clearly, every social ill we see today has its roots in Genesis 6. If you combine, you know, the scripture with a good historical book like Enoch, the book of Enoch, we find out just exactly how these things came when angels left their habitation and came to the earth. And so I'm not trying to teach that tonight. I'm just simply saying that I approached that with a little bit of fear and, 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 uh, and trepidation. <laughs> and, and I knew, I knew that what Brother Branham, as much as I love Brother Branham, I, I respect his ministry like none other. I believe he was a, a manifested son of God. I believe he was a word prophet. And I, you know my position there. I believe the pillar of fire that was with him was not just a nice anointing. It was God. The living word manifested himself to a generation of people to bring a plumb line revelation. And that same living word is about to return to our generation and pick up right where it left off and take these things into fullness. And so I knew that I would have to teach something then, a little contrary to Brother Branham. Brother Branham had incredible revelation. But on a couple of things, he taught just as he had been taught. He was, a, he was a believer in Schofield, and many times he would teach what Schofield said, but then he would have a visitation and correct what he had taught before and teach what the angels told him when they came in the visitation. Uh, the, seven, the seven seals are, are, are 
uh, an example of that, and where he had taught one thing based on other, you know, Schofield and other things he had read, and then he has a visitation from an angel. Well, that changes everything. I think all of us would probably tweak our theology if we have angels come and stand right in front of us and give us a message. So, uh, I don't want to prolong this story, but um, so I knew that Brother Adam had taught that the Nephilim were the offspring of Cain and the daughters of Seth. And, and I didn't believe that. As much as I love him, I didn't believe that. The scriptures just simply don't support that because the scripture says that they the that the benai uh, the benai Elohim saw the benoth Adam, the sons of God saw the daughters of mankind, and they cohabitated and they produce uh, an offspring called the Nephilim, and so I knew that I was going to have to teach that and I, I was going to teach it a little bit different from what Brother Branham had, but I had to go with what I knew to be true. Well, Stephen, of course, you know, um, loves Brother Branham as much as I do. And, uh, and, and, and he believed what I was teaching. He believed what I was teaching. It wasn't, it wasn't like he didn't believe what I was saying. It's just He just had a little bit of a check. He had a little bit of a uneasiness in his spirit, teaching something so openly different from what Brother Branham had taught. And, and he himself had said he'd even taught you know, some of what I had been teaching, but not to the extent. And so he has a visitation. This is what I'm leading up to. The benefit of someone being sent from the cloud of witnesses. Um, Steve's like me. You know, I don't have any desire to see the cloud of witnesses. But if they come, I want to be prepared. He had he was not desiring to see Brother Branham, but he and Stacy had gone to bed one night as right in the midst of me teaching the days of Noah. And uh, he said he woke up with the awareness that someone was in the room. And he sits up in bed. He said, wide awake. And he looks down at the foot of the bed, and there stands William Branham. Now listen, you know, it's one of those deals. You either have to believe the man's telling the truth or he's lying. And I know Stephen Shelley, and I know he wouldn't lie. And I trust him as much as anyone uh, when it comes to these sorts of things. So I, I believe there was a man standing there. And, and Stephen said he was just a little self-conscious because there he is in bed, you know, in his PJs or whatever. And, uh, and so he's, un, he's uneasy. And Brother Branham spoke up to him. And he said, um, um, he said, Stevie, I'm going I'm to read some of it the way Steve wrote it to me just a while ago. He said, Stevie, I see that you have been troubled, and I don't want you to be. And he said, remember that revelation is progressive. He said, and he spoke to him. I remember Steve saying he spoke to him about what I've been teaching on the days of Noah. And he said, uh, he said, don't be troubled about that. He said, remember that revelation is progressive. We can only see what he, the Lord, allows us to see. And he said, I brought what I brought, but that revelation was not for my generation. It was for your generation. He said, I brought with emphasis the things which were most relevant to prepare my generation and the calling that they had to come out of Babylonian systems and calling people back to the word of God as the absolute. This is Brother Branham talking to Stephen. Then he said, what Paul Keith is bringing, I'm like, whoa, you mean to tell me God sent a messenger from heaven and he said my name? I, you know, that, I, already I was blessed. You would be too. Don't act like you wouldn't be. What Paul Keith is bringing, the full revelation of it was reserved for your generation because it will be your generation that must overcome these things. He said, Brother Bam said to Stephen, I want you to stand with him and support him any way that you can. Well, wow. Brother Bam comes. He says, he says, you know, I taught what I taught uh, because I didn't have the full revelation. Revelation is number one, it's progressive. Number two, you get revelation that's pertinent and relevant to your generation. And so you can imagine Steve's faith and my faith went to a total. I mean, I went, my faith in bringing that message, my boldness even, in bringing that message went to an entirely different level. I believe that was a heavenly, what's the fruit of it? Well, the fruit of it was kingdom fruit. And so, uh, you know, there's an example right there of someone that wasn't pursuing it, wasn't seeking it, but God sent a messenger. The Lord could have sent an angelic being. He could have sent a created being if he wanted to. But he sent someone that had relevance to what the issue was. I am convinced if you're contending for the mantles of some of those that have gone before us and you begin to walk in what they carried to some degree, then, then somehow they will be connected to you in your ministry. I'm not saying they're going to appear to you every day or anything like that. I'm just simply saying you can bet your bottom dollar. Uh, the Bible says we have come to Mount Zion. 
we are now surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and you begin to contend and believe for and carry what they carried, they will be there. Uh, they, they will be a part on some level of what, we, of what we're contending for. So I need to move on. Uh, so I want to talk about that for just a moment. The comparison of Mount Sinai with Mount Zion. You know, I had an experience, uh, a couple, I think it was 2010, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 2011, December 21st, uh, 2010, I believe it was. And I had prayed all night, not because I necessarily wanted to, I just ended up having to. Prayed all night, and morning, I saw a little light whirling in my corner of my bedroom, and a little window opened, and lights began to go back and forth. And long story short, you know, I was given Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2. And, uh, and, and then I, right when I got the scripture, the, I got a text from Chuck Pierce's assistant who said Chuck was going to the hospital. And I text right back and said, I just had a, this incredible encounter and a presence came into the room. And, we had, and Chuck, while on, on the way to the hospital, prophesied right back, back up chapter 3, verse 4. So what I want to do is I want to, tell, I want to share the scriptures with you that Paul is talking about when he talks about Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy, and I want, I'm going to address a different aspect of it that I hadn't seen before. A part of it that I have a different opinion of today that I probably had a month ago on Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. It says, The, the Lord came from Sinai, and he dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. Hold that thought. At his right hand there were flashes of lightning for them. Habakkuk 3. God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens. The earth is full of His praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from His hand, for there is the hiding of His power. Exodus 19, talking about the same experience. Mount Sinai was in smoke because the Lord descended upon it, and the smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. <laughs> wow. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. I'm sure he went up cautiously. Psalm 68 verse 7, O God, when you went forth from before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens dripped dew, rain, and at the presence of God, Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. The chariots of God are myriads and thousands upon thousands. Hold that thought. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in holiness. And in Judges, this will be the last one I read on that. Judges 5 says, Lord, when you went out of Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth quaked, the heavens dripped, even the clouds dripped water. The mountains quaked at the presence of the Lord, this Sinai. So here you have the Lord coming down. It's pretty important because Paul is relating it today to what happened then. That what we have is better. That what we have is greater. That what they had that couldn't be touched, we can access. God comes down on Mount Seir, and most of you probably heard me share it, you know, and they were expecting, as most of us would, that he would just come right down on Mount Sinai. Why come across the desert? Because he wanted to be impressive. He wanted to demonstrate uh, in a little bit more broad way who he was. And he comes down on Sierra and he starts marching across the wilderness with fire and lightning and the earth is dripping dew and the ground is quaking and, and lightning's going everywhere and coals of fire, it says in other places. And Almighty God comes rumbling across the wilderness with a shout of a trumpet that was so loud Moses was trembling and he settles up on top of Mount Sinai. But it said that he came in the midst of 10,000 holy ones. Hmm. So Paul is, Hebrews 12, saying that we have come to Mount Zion to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Could there be a connection? A lot of people have always, some theologians have just said that was angels. But I've read a lot today uh, that says, well, maybe we're revisiting that because the word holy ones means sanctified ones. In some translation, it literally says he comes in the midst of 10,000 saints. You might ask the question, well, then if they are saints, who are they? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, who can understand the, the unseen realm fully? How did 
Isaiah, 600 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, see the Lord sitting on a throne already glorified. Because God doesn't live in time, for one thing. You leave time and you go into eternity, everything's different. You know, God, right now as we speak, the Lord is sitting under the bush, uh, under the tree, talking to Abraham, as far as God is concerned. Because he, he holds time in his hand, so all of that can happen simultaneously. He's not, he's not just in the present, he's also in the past as we speak. He's also in the future as we speak. Yes, I know, we can't understand that, but it's true. That's the eternal realm. So he came with 10,000 of his holy ones. I want to look at that a little bit, uh, and, and let's talk about that for just a moment. <clears throat> the expression, have come, is a perfect tense verb. I said that a moment ago. It represents something that's happened, but it's also happening now. Mount Zion is the place of God's habitation, and attributes of that realm include unnumbered hosts. So clearly God comes with angels. There's clearly the role of angels. But angels aren't sanctified ones. They're, they're, they're pure. They're perfect, no doubt. Um, and, I'm, and here again, I'm not trying to create any doctrine. I'm, not, I'm just simply revisiting that and saying, Lord, is, is there something more to what happened at Mount Sinai that's being related to us today? If we, if we have come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, what is the application for us today? If we, on some level, can access Mount Zion, if we can somehow, by a spirit of impartation or by a revelation, access what is described there, we know that the fullness of, uh, of he Hebrews 12, 22 through 24, will come when the Lord sets up his kingdom. It'll come when the resurrection. We know that. When the fullness comes and all these great things are coming. But the Bible says we can taste the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. We can access them on some level. I'm, I'm convinced if it's in the Bible, there's something there for us. There's something we need from that realm. There's something we need from the cloud of witnesses to be what we're called to be. Um, some generation has to get it right. Some, some generation has to miss the potholes that have, that have uh, derailed prior generations, right? Maybe the Lord is allowing this cloud of witnesses to testify to us of God's faithfulness, and maybe they're going to somehow, maybe through dreams, through visions, through inspiration, through visitations even, direct us around the great booby traps that the enemy has set for all these prior generations that have tasted great things in God but lost what they had. There isn't one in the past that hasn't. Every generation as a whole, there are some individuals that saw things to their fullness. There are individuals in prior generations, but it's almost like they were born out of season. Uh, we're not looking for a, a few individuals getting this thing. We're talking about a generation of people getting it. I don't want to be the only one getting it. I want you to get it. And I want to get it myself. But but we need to understand if, if there's something. What, I believe Alexander Dowie could testify today and say, man, do this and do that, but don't do that. Don't call yourself Elijah. That'll cost you your life. Uh, you know, some of the other things that have been done in times past. So, we have come. We have access. The spirits of righteous men made perfect. Made perfect. You know, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, you know, there's something, there's something to Matthew 27 that we really haven't been able to access just yet. It's, it's a number O on the, on the uh, outline if you want to access it. But When the Lord ascended, he went in a cloud. And when he returns, he comes in a cloud. We know that. So there's more to a cloud than, than the cumulus clouds, right? We know that. Clouds in Scripture have a totally different application. I do believe on some occasions he, the Bible refers to a cloud that's in the sky. But when it says the Lord came with, with, in a cloud... Or when it's prophesied by Enoch that he came with 10,000 of his holy ones. I believe he's talking about people. I believe he's talking about saints. It says in Matthew chapter 27, verse 52, that, that the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. <laughs> I looked everywhere I knew to look. I, I did every kind of research I knew how to research. The Apocrypha and the uh, Nicene Fathers and all the different books that we have. And I can't find any place where somebody talked about that. <laughs> you know, why don't we have some books written about that? Why, why, 
I believe God kept that a secret on purpose. I do. We can't find anywhere when somebody said, yeah, uncle so-and-so showed up at dinner. We had been buried for 45 years and here he came. You know, that, that's in essence what it means. I read some silly stuff today. I read in some places where people said, well, God resurrected them only to kill them again. Put them back in the grave. And I'm like, <laughs> I hope that sounds as silly to you as it did to me. That God's going to resurrect somebody just to kill them again. Well, that's not a very good God. You know, I have a feeling when God resurrects somebody, they're alive. They are resurrected. And the reason they say that is because they want to explain a way that maybe God can let them appear again today. Where did they go? You might say, well, they went to heaven. How do you know? There's no scripture that says that. And if they went to heaven, who says they can't come back? If they walk the streets of Jerusalem back in the first century, why can't they walk the streets of Jerusalem today? Who says that can't happen? I know. That's going to open up a whole can of worms with fanaticism. We're going to see Uncle So and So and Prophet So and So, and you know. And I hope those of you that are watching this are mature enough to know that's not what we're after. What I am after is saying God's an awesome God, and, and He holds His kingdom in the palm of His hand. And if He wants to do something, He can do it. I remember when I asked the Lord the question one time, why did you give Secretariat such a large heart? Immediately the answer came back, because it pleased me to do so. That's all the reason he needs. Why did he resurrect dead that had died? Because he wanted to. Because to let you and I know he knows how to do it when he gets ready. That not just he was resurrected, but who, you might say, who was it? We can only speculate. We don't know for sure. But I know there was something to the fact that Joseph felt it was important enough to, to have his bones carried back to Jerusalem to be buried facing the wall, that, uh, that there must be something to this resurrection thing. He must have seen something. In fact, he's remembered in Hebrews 11 because of that, because he had enough faith to believe in something that he had seen, and apparently he had seen the resurrection. Otherwise, he wouldn't have cared where uh, his body would have been buried. So here you have these saints coming out of the graves, and who says they can't be messengers? What, what is it to you, Peter, if John were to live until the, my return? And we try to explain that one away every, every way we know how. But what if it means exactly what it says? What if God just says, you know what? I'm just going to let you live until I return. Why? Because he wants to. Because he has the power to do it. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty much of that belief. I believe John has a huge role to play. I have a friend. Uh, that, has, that has had numerous visitations, uh, written a major selling book from that realm, and he's been telling me that Elijah has been coming to him lately and said that Elijah, Moses, I'm sorry, Elijah, Enoch, and John will have huge roles to play in preparing this last day army. I believe that. I absolutely believe it. If Moses and Elijah can appear to the Lord on the Mount of Transfig Transfiguration, God can send them today. But he's not going to do that flippantly. He's not going to do that without a cause. He's not going to do that without producing fruit. So we have come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. I believe they are the cloud of witnesses. Uh, let me go. I want, I want to read something to also to you. I wrote something I wrote in uh, Engaging the Revelatory Realm, and for whatever reason, I was reminded of it today. I was just doing some reading on, on church history, and uh, clearly, you know, we're already almost 8 o'clock, and I barely got through my notes, so we'll pick it up next time. Um, I have a lot more to share, but um, there's a guy named Tertullian, and when I had the, the experience uh, of seeing the soul of man, um, I, I got understanding about it from reading some of Tertullian's material. He was a 3rd century writer, leader, thinker. Uh, we have an incredible record of his writings. But in, one of, in, in, the, in the book, The Soul, Tertullian talks about the prophetic gift. He, they were already getting opposition in, in, the, in, the, in the third century of, of the, the prophetic realm, the seer realm. Uh, they were already rejecting some of the, the giftings and already wanting to say, well, it was only for Peter, Paul, and John or whatever. And so here, he, he, to validate you know, his position that those are just as applicable today as they were in the, in, in, the, in the first apostles. He writes the record of this woman that was in, in his fellowship. He says this, we, we have now among us a sister whose lot it has been to be favored 
with sundry gifts of revelation which she experiences in the spirit by ecstatic vision. She converses with angels and sometimes even with the Lord. She both sees and hears mysterious signs. Some hearts she is able to understand and to those in need she distributes remedies. Whether in the reading of the scriptures or in the chanting of psalms or in the preparation of sermons or in the offering up of prayers, in all of these services matter and opportunity are afforded her of seeing visions. After the people are dismissed at the conclusion of the sacred services, she is in the regular habit of, re of reporting to us whatever she may have seen in vision. For all her communications are examined with the most scrupulous care in order that their truth may be probed. Here's the part I'm, I'm really after today. Among other things, she says, there has been shown to me a soul in bodily shape. A spirit has been in the habit of appearing to me, not, however, a void and empty illusion, but such as would offer itself to be grasped by the hand, soft and transparent, and of an ethereal color, and in form that of a human being in every respect. Wow. Wow, could it be that maybe she was carrying something that somebody else carried and maybe that person was in the regular habit of appearing to them in, in such a real way that they were, they were tangible. Uh, they had touch, they had appearance, whatever. I, I, I tend to believe that. I, I'm of the belief that what, they, what she was talking about right here was the cloud of witnesses. Let me read you one more from, uh, from, the, from the church fathers. Uh, you can read some of this stuff for yourself, but it's in the church fathers under the martyrdom of Ignatius. Uh, it says, this is an eyewitness account concerning St. Ignatius, and I'm sure I mispronounced that, sorry, the third bishop of Antioch who was thrown to the lions by the Romans in A.D. 110. In A.D. 110. Uh, this, is what they, this is the account. Having, having ourselves eyewitness, having ourselves been eyewitnesses of these things, his martyrdom, we spent the whole night in tears within the house. And having entreated the Lord with bended knees and much prayer, it came to pass on our falling into a brief slumber that some of us saw the blessed, blessed Ignatius suddenly standing by us and embracing us while others beheld him again praying for us. When therefore we had with great joy witnessed these things and had compared our several visions together, we sang praise to God. So here you have already, you know, uh, at the beginning of the second century, a historical account of people that were laying their life on the line, people that were not flippant about their faith, and who, uh, you know, you were you were a believer then, you were a witness then, you were a martyr, and so, uh, which is what we are today, but we're living sacrifices. So let me just take about five more minutes, and then I'll take some questions. By the way, if you have any questions, be sure and send them. I've already got a few, and uh, you, you're welcome to send them. Uh, so I just want to, I want I want to establish one point, and we'll move on next next session to something else. Who are these holy ones? Who are these holy ones coming with the Lord at Mount Sinai, but coming in, 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 on multiple in multiple times? The term holy ones, if you're looking at the outline ver, uh, C, is a much discussed issue with translators having difficulty with the original Hebrew text. In other words, some people say they're saints, some people they're saying they're angels. Who are they? Since Paul places the comparison between Sinai and Mount Zion in the chapter on the cloud of witnesses, then the implication seems to exist that they are affirming saints. That's me. That's my thought. I put that there. I wasn't some scholar. That's me. I believe there's something to that. I believe there's a reason why he, he pulls up Mount Sinai, where, where these holy ones came with the Lord in a cloud. Traditional Hebrew translation of Hebrew, uh, Deuteronomy 33, 2 says this, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned upon them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He proceeded from 10,000 holy ones. A little different. That's the original traditional Hebrew translation. He proceeded from 10,000 holy ones with the fire of law in his right hand. Um, let me just do a couple more here. The Hebrew word for saints in the Old Testament is Kadesh, Kadash. In Psalm 16.3 and Psalms 34.9, if you want to make a note, it is a clear reference to God's people. A variation of the term Kaddish, Q 
P-A-D-D-I-S-H, is used in Daniel 7. The Targum, which is the Jewish uh, commentary on the scriptures, uh, says, says this about it. From Sinai he was revealed, and his glory shone forth from Seir. He appeared to us in his might from Mount Paran, and with him ten thousand holy ones, and he gave us the Torah, which his right hand had written from amidst the fire. So you get, begin to get the picture. Enoch, uh, you know, was quoted in Scripture in Jude. Jude 14 quotes Enoch. This is what it says in, in Enoch's, in the book of Enoch. Enoch prophesied, And the eternal God will tread from there upon Mount Sinai, and he will appear with his hosts, and will appear in the strength of his power from heaven. And behold, he comes with ten thousand holy ones to execute judgment upon them, to destroy the impious, and to contend with all flesh concerning everything which the sinners and the impious have done and brought against him. 1 Enoch 1, 4 and 9. So, so here you have Enoch talking about the Mount, Mount Sinai experience and the Lord coming with 10,000 holy ones, which is what Jude quotes when the Lord is coming with what I believe to be the saints. So he's connecting the two, Enoch is. So Jude, which is scripture, the book of Enoch is not. Uh, you know, it gives it a little bit more credence, the fact that it was quoted multiple times in the New Testament. Uh, 24 times I'm, I've read. I haven't done the research myself, but I mean, the fact that it was quoted, uh, every early Jew, Jewish uh, historical book basically says that every Jewish person had the Torah and the prophecies of Enoch. That's why Jude and others quoted from them. The Lord himself made direct quotes from, from the book uh, from, from Enoch. But we don't call it scripture, so don't misunderstand that. But if, if Jude quotes one portion of that passage relating to the coming of the Lord, then maybe the other portion, he said, has application as well. Jude says, um, It was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, behold the Lord comes with many thousands of his holy ones. A direct quote. Not only to that, but also um, Deuteronomy 33 to execute judgment upon all, to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. He used ungodly like four times. Um, so, so there you have this connection, you know, and uh, one, here's the point I want to make. Some people still contend, some writers still contend that when the Lord comes with, with, you know, with, with the clouds, that it's angels. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. This is what it says in Revelation 19. This is what I listened to this morning. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He who sat upon it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. That's where we are right now. We need to understand this thing. There's a fight. God's picking a fight. The devil's not picking this fight. The Lord opened the heavens, and he's coming down to pick a fight. And he's expecting to empower us to wage war on his behalf before this event comes. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on, it, on him, which no one knows except himself. Uh, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. All right? Who are they? Verse 8 says, It was given to her, the bride, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So the ones that come with the Lord, clothed in fine linen, are the saints. Zechariah 14.5 You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Aziel. Azel. You will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. So my point in all this, the, the spirits of the righteous made perfect, this cloud of witnesses will be coming with the Lord. So just prior to that day, there is escalated activity. The role of the cloud of witnesses in the last day, uh, outpouring and the return of the Lord are undeniable. The scriptures are, I could give you more scriptures. First Thessalonians 3.13. You know, who can deny Zechariah 14 being the return of the Lord? When they begin to divide Jerusalem, the Lord's going to come from heaven and sit on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to split the mountain from east to west and take names. <laughs> and it says here he's coming with, with, uh, with th thousands of the holy ones. 1 Thessalonians 3.13, so, so that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming 
of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So the evidence is un undeniable. The Lord is coming with saints. You know, there may be some angels. I'm not saying angels aren't involved, but he's coming with the saints. The cloud that he's coming with are, are the cloud of witnesses, cloud of saints. And, uh, and, and every age has been welcomed with an introduction of that age. I've said, said another way. Every age has its pioneers. And, and what we're looking at the bride of Christ to be today is a body of people that are accessing what is to come. Meaning we will access Mount Zion. We will access the blessings here. Uh, I haven't even addressed the general assembly, the church of the firstborn who enrolled in heaven. A lot of people say the church of the firstborn is just Christians. I, I, that may be true. But it seems to me like there's more there than that. <laughs> why, why, why would he say the church of the firstborn that are enrolled in heaven? That sounds a little bit strange language just to say they're a Christian, a believer. There's something else to that. There, there's something to that. We haven't really gotten the fullness of that just yet. But, but the part I'm after tonight is the spirits of the righteous made perfect. I hope you can see what I'm saying. The Lord is poised to return. And he's returning with a cloud. He's returning with his kingdom. He's going to fulfill all of these things described in Hebrews 12. But just prior to that, we will begin to introduce it. We'll begin to access it. As Hebrews said, we'll taste it. We'll experience it. We will see things in a part that will be in full in the days ahead. And just before Pentecost, there were people that began to experience Pentecost. Then you had the fullness of the blessing. So for that reason, I believe we have to understand the cloud of witnesses. We need to understand and rightly divide all of the scriptures. I don't want to have any leaven in my thinking. I don't want to neglect any portion of the word. I don't want to shy away from Hebrews 12 or, or, or Hebrews 11 because it's a controversial subject. It's too late for that. We need to understand it. We need to understand what the Bible has to say about the cloud and the cloud of witnesses and the return of the Lord. And, and, and we need to understand it and what the scripture says and validate it by history and and you know, so that's my, my main reason to deal with this whole issue of necromancy, to make, to make people realize that it is legitimate biblical experience to have a, some sort of encounter if, if God so chooses from the cloud of witnesses. But I think in, a, in a, not even a secondary way, but maybe equally as important for us to create an environment for them, for the hosts of heaven, for us to be in agreement with God. And uh, as so many times we've heard lately, come into alignment with heaven and understand that realm. If we understand it more, we can access it more easily. And for that reason, I think we're going to have to begin to say some of these hard things. So I have a whole lot more. Obviously, I didn't get it halfway into my notes here, uh, but we'll pick it up, you know, and, and go further. Let me just see if there's anything else I want to say about this. I guess not. Um, the verb for the made perfect is a certain word uh, in the New Testament and it means to be made perfect by Christ. Simple as that. Um, man, those guys that came out of the grave. What if, what if God decided to send them back? Why not? Um, Moses. You say, well, Moses was dead. Well, he must have not been very long because the Bible says that Michael and, and Satan disputed over his body. So maybe he was resurrected too. Maybe that's why he was able to come with Elijah, who never died. Uh, so if he came once, could he not come again? Um, you know, I don't know where the people are that were resurrected. I don't. I won't presume to even say. Maybe they're in heaven. Maybe they're not. Who knows? Maybe they have a glorified body and can go back and forth. Maybe they have a role to play uh, in today's uh, environment. Uh, I don't want to be flaky about that, but we have no scripture that says otherwise. I can't even find anything in history. But I don't doubt the experience one iota. I believe the graves were split open and we had a resurrection <laughs> just to show you and I that when he gets ready to resurrect us, and some of us may not die, some of us may be the ones that are caught up with the Lord and not hindering those that are raised from the graves and the Lord comes with the spirits and the bodies and those join together and we meet the Lord in the, in the air. And uh, you might say, well, that's going to happen one day in the great Bible. But no, no, listen, we, we're living in the hour. Uh, we, we need to preach that now. So, so amen. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, got a couple of questions. I have a few here already. Um, <clears throat> Beth, 
how you can say her last name, asked the question, um, can you explain what you mean by watchers? You mentioned them uh, in the context of angels, cherubim, four living creatures, and other supernatural beings. Uh, of course, I'd like to know the scriptural basis for what you're calling the watchers. Easily. Go, go to Daniel 4. Hope you're there with your Bible. Uh, Beth and anyone else, uh, you know, that's interested in that subject. Um, you know, we, we've said already that the book of Enoch is not scripture, but it's clearly inspired. Uh, I mean, you know, inspired means, you know, prophecy today can be inspired. But Daniel 4 talks about the watchers. It talks about, um, um, let's see here, if I can find the right scripture. I, I wasn't expecting to get that one, but help me out, guys. Help me find the, the scripture in Daniel 4 that talks about the watchers. Um, <clears throat> I was looking in the visions, verse 13, in my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven, and he shouted out and spoke as following, chopped down the tree. In other words, he brought a decree. Verse 17, this sentence is by a decree of the watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realms of mankind. So this is the only scripture I know of that talks about the existence of watchers. Um, in this case, they brought a judgmental decree. Uh, I believe they can, bring, they can bring more than judgmental decrees. Now, if you include the book of Enoch, uh, as a historical record, not a inspired, uh, not a scriptural validated, you know, record. The watchers were the two hundred watchers fell. They were the ones that came, left their domain. It says in the New Testament, in Peter and in Jude. Uh, watchers were the ones that somehow had um, jurisdiction in the earth. They had the ability. It's believed that perhaps there were watchers that came with Moses, uh, Abraham. That that ate cow's flesh and ate cornbread. You know, they, they were tangible, physical forms. It may be been or may not have been. I don't know. Many times you see manifestations of people in a human form. Even today it says you can entertain an angel without even knowing about it. But these watchers carried decrees. They had authority in the earth on some level. And it says in the book of Enoch that the 200 watchers that fell came down on Mount Hermon and uh, they began to cohabitate with the daughters of mankind and then they began to share what they knew about creation. Uh, they shared pharmacia, which is drugs. They shared sorcery and witchcraft, the source of sexual immorality, witchcraft. All the social ills today were the result of those watchers that fell uh, in the days of uh, prior to Enoch or prior to Noah, and and uh, and cohabitated and created all the you know another level of chaos. And uh, we know that, um, you know, oh, there's too much to go into that right now. I don't want to say too much about that, except, you know, th those are the watchers. I believe they can bring a decree that's fruitful or a decree that's judgmental. Um, I think that's, that's obvious, you know. I had an experience where I saw a watcher one time. And it, and it, it didn't, it was startled me, it frightened me. I, uh, he was about seven and a half, eight feet tall and had uh, golden, very bright golden breastplate. And I... The only reason I know it was a watcher, I said, who, who is he? And, and the voice said, he's a watcher. And he stepped right back into the wall. And uh, that was my only experience. I know Bob Jones has had an experience with watchers and others. But, you know, sometimes we throw everything in the, in the category of an angel. Well, the term angel, angelos, is a messenger. But, but uh, I think we have to look at the fact that, that a living creature is a living creature, not an angel. Um, you know, a holy one, you know, these different things have different roles to play. And a watcher is a watcher, not necessarily an angelic being per se, but a watcher. So I hope that helps you. Uh, that's my perspective on it, you know, and there's a lot more to, uh, to understand about that. You brought some more right here? Okay. <clears throat> I've had an, uh, open visions of people encircled by clouds, and they are looking down at me. They are gray. They seem to move around, and they seem to be talking to one another as they look. Do you know if these are part of the cloud of witnesses? And what could this mean for me or others? Well, possibly, sure, possibly. Um, you know, I don't have enough here to say emphatically that is, but I think that's certainly descriptive of what I have seen and what others have seen in that regard. Um, you know, as I said earlier, there's many forms of revelation, and I don't diminish any. Every form of revelation is powerful from God. 
the orbs that sometimes people say, I, 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 there's, there's value in that, but if an orb comes, I'm not going to say I had an angelic visitation. Um, because that's that's an orb. I don't know what it is. It, it may be you know maybe a light. It may be a presence. It may be some form of angelic host. But but uh, if you see things around people, sometimes I see light around people's heads. Uh, we've had meetings where clouds come, and some of it could be the cloud of witnesses, or it could be just the cloud of His glory. So I don't know. It could be a number of things. I would look at the context. I would look at the fruit of what happens. Um, do we have enough time? Keep going. All right. Caleb says, keep going. Uh, thank you for these webinars. They are real. Thank you very much. You said this, V. Gilmore. Uh, my question is: Is there a special function for or importation from impartation from the cloud of witnesses to us in the remnant that cannot be given, revealed by the Holy Spirit or angelic beings? Another way, another way. Why then them and not the other two mentioned above? Okay. Hope I hope I read that clear enough. They're saying why the cloud of witnesses when God gives them. You know, is there something they carry that uh, that God could not do by the Holy Spirit or angelic beings? Well, obviously God can do whatever. He can send an angel or he can send whoever. But I think the, the secret to what you're asking can be found in Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, where it says that that, that, that these people that were we call the cloud of witnesses that were champions, the Bible says they obtained a testimony. They found favor with God. And they saw something and invested themselves in it, but didn't see the fullness of it. And for that reason, because the fullness of what God promised or the fullness of what they saw, the fullness of what they prayed into wasn't achieved in their generation, they then somehow earned the right to be in the cloud of witnesses to, to uh, part of help. <laughs> they can be a messenger if God chooses to use them as a messenger, or he can choose an angel. Or he can, you know, I think everything, obviously, is done under the jurisdiction of the Holy Spirit. The Lord is the captain of the hosts. So that means there's um, myriads of hosts. I believe the seven spirits of God have, have, uh, for lack of a better term, angels under them that carry those attributes. In other words, I've seen spirits of revelation that work under the jurisdiction of the spirit of revelation, which is one of the seven spirits of God. And so God can send that or... Maybe uh, if someone is carrying a portion of what another minister or person carried in life, then maybe they can testify. That's what it says, that we're surrounded by a cloud of testifiers. And, and I, in one of the sessions, I shared what each one of the ones listed, not each one, most of the ones listed in Hebrews 11, testified of in their lifetime. So I hope that helps you. Um, it says, P.S., I do sense the spirit dimension membrane is getting thinner every day. I believe that too. Absolutely. Um, I'm hearing Paul Keith's perspective on when and where the great cloud of witnesses tend to be revealed most often. This is from Susan. Um, you know, the word there, most often, you know, who knows Who knows where the Lord chooses and why he chooses to do what he did. Why did the Lord choose to send William Branham to, to Stephen that night? You know, Stephen, uh, maybe it was to give me faith. Maybe it was to give me faith. A little humorous part of that story I didn't tell. Um Stephen, you know, told me the story of what Brother Brown said to him. And, and I said, well, that, was that all he said? And he said, no, there was a little more, but I don't, I don't want to say. And I, I said, what do you mean there's a little more? You, you're obligated to tell me because he's used my name and told you to help me, so you've got to tell me what he said. I don't want to do what he said. We went back and I said, you're going to have to tell me what he said. And so he wouldn't tell me. He wrote it and sent it to me. <laughs> and the last part of it was he said, he said, um, he said, uh, I want you to stand with Paul Keith and support him in any way you can. He said, uh, I know it's hard to be his friend, but God has called you to be his friend. <laughs> he said, and Brother Bannon said he's, he had a hard upbringing, and it made him a little unusual or something to that effect, which, you know, my wife would probably say, that's right. But, I, you know, I am what I am by the grace of God. <clears throat> I'm working on it. I'm working on getting out of my idiosyncrasies. But... Um, uh, Says where the cloud. I, I believe they come in a general way. If I can just give a, an answer, where do they come from? They come where they're talked about. They come where what they believed for is being manifested or contended for or believed for. That's what I believe. On the other side, God can just send them anywhere He wants to. They're messengers, in my in my belief. They're not the only messengers, but they can be a messenger. 
This is from uh, Deborah Orgel. Deborah in England. Uh, I said your whole name. I hope that's okay. Uh, Deborah is a great friend of ours over in England and comes to all of our meetings in England. It's such a great source of encouragement. It says in Hebrews 11, Abraham, she always asks hard questions, so I'm kind of anxious to see what comes up too, by the way. It says in Hebrews 11, Abraham was waiting for the city whose builder and maker is God. In Hebrews 12, we are told that this city, mountain, is Mount Zion, and you said the great cloud of witnesses. Do you think that Mount Zion and or the great cloud of witnesses is the model for the new hubs? Hmm. I think, I think the great cloud of witnesses is part of Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the habitation of God, the dwelling place of God. Well, we're called to be the, the dwelling place of God. We're called to be the tabernacle. In other words, you might even say that the remnant is the Zion company. The remnant is the Zion company. And, uh, and so uh, let me make sure I get all this. It says, do you think that Mount Zion and the cloud of witnesses is the model for the new hubs? Well, I clearly think what John saw in Revelation, what Paul prophesied in Hebrews 12, is the model. No doubt about it. I believe it is part of what we have to see in the future and bring back and establish today. We cannot look to the past to build a container or a model for what's coming. We have to look to the future, and the future is this. So absolutely, Deborah, I believe we've got to somehow access that realm, visit it, see it, experience it, receive messengers from it, whatever it takes to access what Paul describes in Hebrews 12 so that we can begin to build the, the hubs, this community that's going to be built on the earth before the Lord returns. Because what we build will go right into the millennium. The Lord has told me that. That's a great question. This is from Cindy. It says, uh, in Daniel 4.13, a watcher is called a holy one. In Daniel 4.17, the decision is made by the decree of the watchers. And the sentence is by the word of the holy ones. Tonight, in some of the scriptures you cited, holy ones are mentioned. Can this mean holy ones are Daniel are in Daniel four also maybe referred to as a cloud of witnesses? I don't believe so. The, 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 the term holy ones is used on multiple occasions, sometimes in referencing, clearly referencing something from heaven, a created being. Sometimes it's referring to to people, and that's why I use the foundation of what Enoch prophesied with what Jude prophesied with the Revelation. 19 talking about the cloud being in those in those instances saints men many women of the faith spirits of the righteous made perfect so uh it can be used interchangeably the context reveals that sometimes it's the same language and so it does get a little confusing but i believe these watchers are uh, not saints i don't believe they're the righteous uh, or, or pre pre-cross people either i believe they are literally created beings with a unique task that God sent into the earth. And uh, we know that 200 fell. We know historically 200 fell. Uh, we know they fell because and we know that they're in prison right now. Those 200, Peter says so in Jude. We know that something happened. We know that some created beings left their domain and came into this realm. And for that, they were punished. Um, and we also know that even after the flood, after all the seed, you know, that um, seed bed was destroyed, that there were giants again, even for longer than there were before. And so how did they come? You know, there's only two th schools of thought. Did they come, uh, did they come by, uh, one, one school of thought is that Cain, uh, Ham's wife was of, of the seed of the Nephilim or that somewhere in her there was that genealogy. That's what some people believe. The other school of thought is that the watchers came again and cohabitated with women again. I lean towards that one because I just don't see God accidentally letting Ham's wife get in the ark after he went to the trouble of destroying every breathing thing on planet earth. That he would, that he would allow that to happen in the ark. I, um, that, that may be the case. If it is, we'll find out in heaven. But the reality is something happened post flood to create on the earth. Again, Nephilim, David had to defeat them. And, uh, and for what reason it stopped, I don't know. Maybe those angels went to prison too. Who knows? Maybe there's a huge cost to pay for those watchers to, to violate that law that God established. But I hope that, uh, I hope that helps you. Um, <clears throat> all right, this is from Laura. I believe I am correct in, in saying I heard you say you don't desire to have an encounter with the great cloud of witnesses. 
if it is, I, I knew I was going to get something on that one. I didn't phrase that very well, Laura. I know what you're going to say. My pursuit is not an encounter with a cloud of witnesses. I hope that's what I'm trying to say. Um, my desire is for the Lord. Um, my, my purpose in being, my, my reason for getting out of bed every day is the Lord. I don't get up in the morning thinking, man, maybe the cloud of witnesses are coming today. I, it's a wonderful thing, and I believe it to be part of our destiny. I do. I believe it to be part of my destiny. It has already been. It has already been. I've, I've encountered, I've seen people, I've had conversations with people that, that are among the cloud of witnesses. And so I believe that will be part of it. My point in saying that was that our emphasis is not them. It's the Lord. I think if any one of us, I think if any one of us put attention, undue attention on the cloud of witnesses, they themselves would be grieved. I believe Mary is horrendously grieved at the way she has been elevated in the minds of people. She is among the cloud of witnesses. She is an awesome woman, one of the greatest women, maybe the greatest woman who ever lived, the one God chose to bear his fleshly body. That's pretty amazing. But she needed the blood of her son just like everybody else, and she, she has no place in the Godhead, even though there is an organization that wanted to deify Mary. They might, they might pass a dogma, but that won't make Mary be anything more than she was. A sinner saved by grace. And so I believe she is grieved by people desiring her or whatever. So I hope that, hope you know, I probably didn't use a great choice of words. My desire is the Lord, but I absolutely would welcome anybody God wants to send to me to bring any kind of message from heaven. Let me see if it's uh, anything else in here that I didn't say. I think that was it. Thanks, Laura, for helping me clear that up. This is from uh, Maria. Mariah or Maria. Um... Today I read that the Cardinals went into the Sistine Chapel to elect the next Pope and they, pro they processed enchanting the litany of the saints. Growing up I had to pray this litany six out of seven days each week. Basically one person would call out the names of a long succession of saints and we would say pray for us in response. Apparently they are trying to get some input from the cloud of witnesses to make their decision. It has really grieved me that they are doing this at this level. What do you say? If you care to comment, I don't mind coming at all. I believe they're welcoming demons. That's what I believe. I believe if they call out the names of people and they say pray for us, they're in violation of Scripture, and it opens the door to the demonic. That's what I believe. It's sad. It is sad. And I, I addressed, you know, uh, early on that we don't believe in, in, you know, Catholics got some things right. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying they missed everything on the cloud of witnesses, but we sure don't believe in praying to anybody for anything other than the Lord. There's one mediator between God and man. What they need to be doing is on their face before the Holy Spirit begging the Lord to forgive them for doing that and asking Almighty God to give them the wisdom they need and leave the saints alone. And uh, this is gr very grievous and it's unfortunate, but I don't believe it has anything to do with the kingdom of God. One more, I think, and that's it. Not too late, huh? Um... Considering Matthew 27, uh, 52 and 54 and other scriptures which refer to bodies being raised from the dead is a decision of cremation for believers appropriate. Wow, that's a good one. You know, um, there's no scripture on it. I wouldn't be, um, but if people have been, I, I wouldn't be stressed over it. You know, there have been people that have been eaten by lions. <laughs> you know, people have, have been, you know, devoured by sharks. And, you know, so God knows right where they are. Um, so I, I'm not concerned about that at all. Um, you know, if somebody wants to be cremated, I don't, I don't know of a scripture that said, you know, that a lot of Christians were burned at the stake. <laughs> in essence, cremated. Um, so you know, I personally would rather just be in my body. But you know what? If somebody has me, I, don't, I would be too concerned about it. Uh, I'll, I'll do a little more research on it and see if there's anything I can find in scripture about it. But, but, um, but I, I do believe it is important, you know, how we bury it. It was important. Um, to Joseph and the other saints, but um, but that's my view on it. Just off the top of my head, I haven't done a lot of study on that, to be honest. But uh, God knows right where we are. <laughs> he knows exactly where even one little cell of who we are exists to raise us from the dead. So um, I'm not concerned about that. Well, amen. We got a good group in here, you know, and got John Sumner and Dave and Caleb and Austin and Wanda and Nancy. We got a good little group in here, amen to me. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, send us your input, you know, as long as this is a blessing to you, we're going to keep doing it. We had 600 plus um, connections last time. I had a couple of notices that churches had joined us, so I'm thankful for that. Uh, 
as long as it blesses you and it gives me this opportunity to get my message out to the people that love us and care for us, you know, it's a great, it's a great thing. I, I would be, I'll be disappointed if I wasn't able to have this connection with you guys. So uh, pray for us if you would, you know, in this time, the Lord's just simply not letting us travel. Uh, I've gotten invitations almost every day, great ones too, to go to great meetings. And the Lord is just saying no. He's just saying no, and so I'm having to be obedient. It's not easy, but I'm having to do it. I have a couple of meetings that I had already committed to last in 2012 that I'm taking. That's that I, I mean, not that I've taken, but that I'm fulfilling. I will be coming to England in May because it was something I had agreed to last year, and I'm looking forward to that. But uh, past uh, past July, I don't think I have but one meeting, and that's with Barbara Yoder. So uh, we're really, you know, trusting the Lord right now. And uh, but it's been good, but I'll be able to get better. I'll be able to get better. So, amen. The Lord bless everybody that's watched, and thank you for those who give. And Lord, just let the word go in deep. Lord, if I didn't explain things well, let your Holy Spirit give illumination to what was really being said and the heart of what we're trying to achieve. Lord, we just want the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. I don't want to leave any portion of it out. And this is clearly an important portion, and we ask that you help us to understand it. Make us fruitful in your kingdom, we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.